Hi, welcome to our uh, webinar today. Today I'm going to be uh, conducting a webinar called Improving Outcomes for Patients with Psoriatic Arthritis, Integrating a Comprehensive Patient-Centered Model into Your Practice. So today we have joining us rheumatologists and dermatologists as well as nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alexis Ogdi. I am an Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. I am a rheumatologist by training and an epidemiologist. I conduct research in psoriatic arthritis in particular, and I'm very interested in the connections between dermatologists and rheumatologists and how we treat patients together. All right, so today as a part of this webinar, we have a, a variety of different learning objectives. So I'm gonna break each of these different sections into different um, objectives. So I'll introduce the objective, go through some uh, topics, and then have a couple questions along the way where I'll pause to let you answer a question. All right, so our first learning objective is to employ screening and assessment strategies to diagnose patients with psoriatic arthritis in clinical practice. So some of this is gonna be a very basic background for um, more the dermatologists and NPs and PAs, and hopefully the rheumatologists will get a little bit of um, reintroduction to some of these topics as well. So first of all, psoriatic arthritis is a member of the spondyloarthritis group. So the spondyloarthritis group is comprised of a few different disorders that share a common tissue distribution and similar disease features. So ankylosing spondylitis is always the prototype of this set of diseases, um, but it also includes reactive arthritis, an uh, uh, inflammatory arthritis that fo follows an infection. Um, that's typically short-lived and usually goes away within about six months. And then there's enteropathic arthritis or IBD-associated arthritis, goes by several different names. Um, however, this is an inflammatory arthritis that comes along with IBD. So it's in a patient who has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Um, they may also have a peripheral arthritis or they may have axial disease as well. And finally, there's psoriatic arthritis. So in all of these disorders, they may have axial disease. Obviously, ankylosing spondylitis primarily does. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, by the way, has been renamed as axial spondyloarthritis. And we don't generally use the term ankylosing spondylitis anymore, recognizing that patients can have disease in their spine that hasn't yet resulted in radiographic damage. So now we often will classify this whole set of disorders as axial predominant or peripheral predominant. Um, psoriatic arthritis tends to be mostly peripheral predominant, although axial disease is present in 20 to 50% of patients, depending on what statistics you look at. So how do we define psoriatic arthritis? Well, there's not good diagnostic criteria, quote unquote diagnostic. We have classification criteria. So classification criteria are used to define a homogenous group of patients for enrollment in clinical trials or clinical studies. But it just so happens that these classification criteria can be really useful for clinical practice as well. So these classification criteria define psoriatic arthritis as an inflammatory arthritis, enthesitis, or spondylitis that is associated with psoriasis. So in order to enter the criteria, you must have inflammatory arthritis, meaning joint swelling, enthesitis, or spondylitis. Then you need three points from this set of points in this box. So the first box is psoriasis. So if you have current psoriasis, you get two points. If you have uh, a personal history of psoriasis, you get one point. Or if you have a first degree family member that has a history of psoriasis, you get one point. So you can only get one set of points from that box. Then you can also get one point for having typical psoriatic nail dystrophy. So the uh, nail dystrophy is very common in psoriatic arthritis. And we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through disease features. But one of the more common uh, types of nail dystrophy is pitting in the nail. So it looks like someone literally took a pin and pushed into the nail. Um, you can also get crumbling of the nails or kind of onycholysis, which is kind of an eating away of the nail. If you have a negative rheumatoid factor, you get one point. If you have dactylitis, which has to be recorded by a rheumatologist, preferably because it um, turns out that the reliability of dactylitis ascertainment is much lower among other types of physicians. And then you can also get one point for having radiographic evidence of juncta articular new bone formation in the hands or feet. So that's those wispy new bone formation around the joints. Um, that's much less common these days using the classification criteria. So as a, kind of to recap classification criteria for psoriatic arthritis, if you have inflammatory arthritis, enthesitis, or spondylitis, and three points from any one of these boxes, then you meet criteria for psoriatic arthritis. So obviously there may be situations when people have physician-diagnosed psoriatic arthritis but don't meet the criteria. Turns out that's actually quite rare though. 
these criteria are very sensitive and fairly specific as well for um, psoriatic arthritis at any stage. All right, so now let's move on to what are the features of psoriatic arthritis? What should any rheumatologist, dermatologist, MP, PA, or primary care physician be looking for? So peripheral arthritis is, a, is the most common uh, manifestation of psoriatic arthritis. About half of patients will have an oligoarticular disease, meaning they're less than five joints, and the other half will have a polyarticular presentation of five or more joints. Um, now, people may change over time. So this is, you know, if you're being treated, you may become oligoarticular, for example. But we generally mean it to mean what you have off of treatment. Um, and tends to be that oligoarticular people, many of them will progress to more polyarticular disease, and we don't have good prognostic factors for that right now. In addition to peripheral arthritis, about 40% of patients will have dactylitis at any time in their course, um, about 10% at any one time if you're just looking at people with active disease at this time. Dactylitis is swelling of an entire finger or toe such that it looks like a big sausage, so we call this a sausage digit. Axial disease, I've already touched on a little bit. Um, somewhere around 20 to 40% of patients have axial disease. Um, again, this depends largely on how it's defined. So if you define by radiographic damage, it's gonna be in the much lower end, 10 to 20%. Um, but if you're talking about symptoms of inflammatory back pain, that can be even higher, around 50 to 60%. So we sometimes just have to say somewhere in that 20 to 40% range. We'll talk about assessment of axial disease in a, minute, in a few minutes here. Um, psoriasis is present in the majority of patients who have psoriatic arthritis. So about 85% of patients will have psoriasis. They may have, not have it currently, but they would generally have a personal history of psoriasis. There may be a small segment of people who have psoriatic arthritis who don't have known psoriasis, but this is relatively uncommon, around 10 to 15% of people. And they're diagnosed based on the distribution of disease and often have either dactylitis or nail pitting or nail onycholysis, something that would um, make you think that it is more likely to be psoriatic arthritis. Um, in addition, about half of patients will have enthesitis during the course of the disease. Enthesitis is inflammation where a tendon, ligament, or joint capsule inserts onto the bone. So you can imagine that entheses are common throughout the body, although we pay specific attention to certain entheses. So for example, where the Achilles inserts onto the calcaneus, or where the plantar fascia also inserts onto the calcaneus. Those are common sites for um, enthesitis. In addition, there's enthesitis you know, at the lateral epicondyle or the medial epicondyle, and so they may have tenderness there. And we literally assess for that by pushing um, down on the top of the bone until our uh, finger blanches white and assessing for tenderness. So you can imagine tenderness is quite common at those sites. Um, but then if you look with an uh, ultrasound probe, you can actually see inflammation in many of those patients. Um, finally, I listed comorbidities here. Over half of patients have at least one comorbidity, and we'll kind of talk more about the comorbidities specifically associated with psoriatic arthritis. But if we're thinking about a comprehensive treatment plan for psoriatic arthritis, we really need to consider all of these features, including comorbidities. All right, so I've mentioned the different features of psoriatic arthritis, including peripheral arthritis, nail disease, enthesitis, axial disease, as well as dactylitis. Um, what I haven't talked about yet is the heterogeneity. So these are obviously heterogeneous tissues, but in addition, I always say that each patient looks very different from one another. So you can have a wide range of different types of presentations. Some people may have predominantly finger involvement and maybe enthesitis, or some people may have predominantly dactylitis and really not have much other peripheral enthesitis aside from the digits involved with dactylitis. So it's really um, a mixed bag of different kinds of involvement. So that makes it really hard to identify sometimes, particularly for dermatologists, let's say, if you're in clinic, um, sometimes enthesitis can occur early and you're not really, it's not like something you generally see, it's something you would push on. In this particular picture in the middle here, I do show a patient with um, Achilles enthesitis that you can actually see Again, that's not actually that common. Most of the time, it's just tenderness. So because of this heterogeneity, it can be hard to pick up. So it's important to ask about these different symptoms and just recognize these symptoms. Now, everything I've talked about so far is really from the physician perspective, what we see when we're taking a look at the patient. However, it's also a heterogeneous disease in terms of how patients um, experience the disease. 
So some patients may tell you about the physical dysfunction limitations. For example, if your knee is involved, you may not be able to walk well, or if your hands are involved, you may not be able to cut well. So people will often talk about difficulty making dinner or holding pots and pans, um, holding a coffee cup. But beyond those things that seem more obviously associated with inflammatory arthritis, there's also these other um, symptoms that come along with the disease. Fatigue, so patients can um, mention fatigue, particularly early in the course of the disease or when their disease is really active. They sometimes say like they feel like they've run out of energy or their batteries run out, particularly sometime midway through the day, and they just keep, can't keep going. This can impact work too, so either from having pain or from being fatigued, people have trouble getting through the day. If you're having pain and fatigue, you're not gonna wanna go out and socialize sometimes. And this, this might be confounded by the psoriasis as well. People become very embarrassed by the skin manifestations of psoriasis and don't want their friends to see or other people to see. So people can socially isolate, which can cause more depression, for example. The family role is really important. This can be very disturbed um, in if you have really active arthritis. Um, so people might not be able to care for their children or their elderly parents in the way that they would want to be able to care for them. And the spouse might have to pick up extra duties. So this can be difficult for the whole family. Um, I listed emotional well-being here. About 30 to 40% of patients experience depression, anxiety, or both. And this can be related, related to a variety of different things, either not being able to complete the tasks that they want to complete or um, just can be can kind of travel along with the disease. So it's something to be aware of. And then finally, poor sleep. So poor sleep can be a multifactorial thing, just like fatigue, um, but it can be related to having pain and waking in the middle of the night. It can also be related to anxiety um, about when your next flare is gonna happen, how you're gonna get through your next, the day tomorrow, being behind at work because you're not able to keep up. Um, so all these things can contribute to poor sleep. Uh, poor sleep, depression, um, and fatigue can all contribute to patient reported outcomes too. Uh, so these are all important things to address in terms of coming up with a comprehensive plan. And we'll come back to that shortly here. I mentioned early in, earlier uh, the importance of comorbidities. So what are the comorbidities associated with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? I've listed the most common ones here on this slide. Um, Cardiovascular disease is one of our most important comorbidities associated with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Among patients with severe psoriasis, so psoriasis involving more than 10% of their body surface area, um, or even 5% of their body surface area, there's a significant increase in the risk for cardiovascular disease. And this is also true in patients with psoriatic arthritis. So the risk depends on the study, but somewhere between a 30% to a two-fold increase in the risk for cardiovascular disease in these patient populations. Thus, it's really important to screen for other uh, metabolic comorbidities. Additionally, it just so happens that patients with psoriatic arthritis tend to be more obese than patients with, uh, without psoriatic arthritis, even more obese than patients with psoriasis alone. And there's a much higher incidence in of diabetes in patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, particularly in patients with psoriatic arthritis and patients with severe psoriasis. Um, so as you're screening your labs that you get to monitor therapy, this is something important to notice that high glucose and act on it and further work it up. When you're talking about metabolic comorbidities, one of the other comorbidities that tends to travel with that is fatty liver disease. Um, fatty liver disease is also significantly increased in patients with psoriatic arthritis, both in terms of incidence and prevalence. So this is important to keep in mind with, when you're selecting therapies and monitoring those liver function tests. We've already mentioned depression and anxiety, so I'll kind of scoot past that one for now. We'll come back to that in a bit. Inflammatory bowel disease and uveitis are associated with the spinoarthritis subgroup, a, uh, a group of disorders. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, meaning Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So the incidence of Crohn's is significantly increased in patients with psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis. Ulcerative colitis incidence isn't actually that, um, that much elevated. Uh, but if people are having new diarrhea, for example, or um, gastrointestinal disorders, it's important to have them evaluated by gastroenterology and to recognize that that link is there. Um, uveitis it affects about 10% of patients with psoriatic arthritis, lower in patients with psoriasis alone. Among our patients with psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, actually, 
Um, the most common eye disease is actually just dry eyes. So we don't really know exactly why there is that, that link, but our patients frequently report dry eyes. All right, so we've talked about disease features. We've talked about the ways in which patients experience the disease. And we've talked about the medical comorbidities. So this summarized so far the different ways in which this dis disorder is heterogeneous and all these things we need to keep in mind as we kind of select a management plan. So we're gonna come back to the management plan, but before we get there, let's talk about epidemiology of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. How common are these disorders? Well, psoriasis is one of the more common uh, skin conditions in the United States that affects about two to 3% of the adult, patient, adult population in the US. Um, probably closer to that 2%, but somewhere in the, Western, in the Western world in general, psoriasis is pretty common. And then among patients with psoriasis, somewhere between 10 and 30% of patients with psoriasis will have at some point be diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. Um, and we think that probably there is, a, a, particularly among patients with moderate to severe psoriasis, there's quite a bit of undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis as well. So that's part of the reason for doing this is to kind of get this information out there to say there's a lot of undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis in your dermatology clinics. So it's important to really think about this. Um, the male to female ratio for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are one to one. So there's no sex predilection. Um, age at onset varies widely. In psoriasis, there's some thought to be kind of an earlier peak and a later peak where patients can get it in their childhood and then um, kind of in their 50s. Psoriatic arthritis onset is pretty um, across the board, somewhere between the 30s and the 50s is kind of the most common group, however. Um, if you're getting it later in the 60s, 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that's pretty uncommon. It's probably more likely to be osteoarthritis. The 30s, 40s, 50s, more likely to be psoriatic arthritis. And this can happen in kids. Um, the onset in kids tends to be a little bit different and that the um, onset of the arthritis may precede onset of the psoriasis. So something to keep in mind. So what's the presentation look like? On average, patients tend to have um, their psoriasis for about seven to eight years prior to diagnosis with psoriatic arthritis. But in, there's still a large chunk of patients who have both diseases presenting around the same time. So maybe that the skin comes just slightly before the joints or they may notice the joints first when the skin is there and they just haven't really picked up on it yet. Um, there's not a, a specific correlation between the severity of the skin and the severity of the joints at any one point in time. You can have really bad psoriasis and mild psoriatic arthritis, for example, or really bad psoriatic arthritis and really mild psoriasis, or both could be bad or both could be mild. On the other hand, patients with more severe psoriasis, moderate to severe psoriasis, have a significantly increased risk for developing psoriatic arthritis. I'm not exactly sure why that is, and we'll kind of come back to risk factors in a little bit. Um, nail findings are commonly associated with, with having joint disease, although there's a large number of people with psoriasis and nail findings that don't develop the disease, uh, don't, don't develop joint disease. All right, so let's take a breather and bring up our first audience response question. Um, so the answer is C, biomechanical stress can trigger psoriatic arthritis. So while HLA-B27 can be, it is associated with psoriatic arthritis, it tends to be more associated with axial disease, maybe even more um, with more severe disease. Um, but about half of patients or more uh, with axial psoriatic arthritis don't even have positive HLA-B27, and the prevalence of, of HLA-B27 in psoriatic arthritis is overall low. So we don't think it's a key player in the pathogenesis of PSA. Um, it's thought that mi microbiome perturbations could lead to development of synovial emphysema inflammation. Currently, we don't have evidence that it can reverse it, although there's, obvious, there's lots of studies ongoing to address that particular question. Um, and biomechanical stress can trigger PSA, so there's some reasonably good data, including a large observational cohort study that I was part of, in which we have found that um, trauma is associated with development of PSA. Um, among patients with psoriasis and among patients in the general population. Um, and this may be for several reasons. Uh, there's been some interesting mouse studies in which uh, they have suspended the mouse of their back hind legs can't touch the ground. Um, and this mouse would otherwise be predisposed to developing PSA. 
but if they're they're not getting biomechanical stress, then they can't develop the disease. They don't develop the disease. So that kind of leads us to think that there is some importance of biomechanical stress and maybe even the shear forces that are happening at the end thesis that lead to development of PSA. So a lot to still learn, but that's what we currently think. All right, so that leads us into talking about what might cause psoriatic arthritis. So recently we uh, published this paper in Nature Reviews Rheumatology kind of detailing what we know so far about the transition from psoriasis to psoriatic arthritis. And this paper is led by uh, Jose Scher. Um, so the concept here is that there's a continuum. So a patient may have psoriasis and there's a, ser a series of steps along the way that happen between having just skin disease and no joint disease and having full blown clinical PSA. So what we think is that among patients with psoriasis, there's some proportion of patients that have either genetic risk factors or other environmental risk factors that may lead to them being at a higher risk for developing PSA. And then somewhere along the way, they may develop a second hit. So similar to some of our thoughts about why cancer develops, there's some underlying predisposition, there's a second hit that triggers this inflammation to begin. Um, so this concept then is that at some point, there's a second hit or a trigger that leads to a preclinical state of inflammation in the joint. And then at that point, we can't see it when it first begins. Then there's some subclinical state where the patient isn't necessarily feeling the specific joint area involvement, but if you put an ultrasound probe on one of the joints or the anthesis, you may see inflammation in that area. Um, and then there's maybe some prodromal phase. So this prodromal phase, we, we kind of made up this term because we don't know exactly how to call it yet, but a lot of times what we see is that patients have some general achiness, maybe some morning stiffness that we can't quite put our finger on yet. There's not specific joints that are swollen yet, but they feel not well, maybe fatigued, um, a little bit of malaise, um, exhausted, for example. And then within months to a year or even years, they may develop clinically overt psoriatic arthritis. Now this continuum may work in different ways and may have different speeds for different people people, but it's, this is our way of kind of thinking through how this might happen and also kind of putting a note in our head that if a patient is presenting with psoriasis and these prodromal symptoms or just not feeling well, maybe a fibromyalgia-like presentation, that's someone to still keep an eye on, maybe not treat, but maybe you'll have a lower threshold for treatment if, if they develop joint swelling. Um, so if that's the kind of person I'll see back at least once a year, just kind of monitor for development of psoriatic arthritis. So if you're sitting in a dermatology clinic or even a primary care clinic and you have a patient with psoriasis come in, how much you screen them for whether or not they're developing or the, whether or not they have psoriatic arthritis? Well, a number of screening tools have been developed. These are questionnaires that range from one to, to three, two to three pages long. Um, one of the most common questionnaires used is called the PEST or the Psoriasis Epidemiology Screening Tool. This is a free tool, it's available online you can actually find it on the National Psoriasis Foundation website, or if you can just Google it, you can find the PDF form. It's five questions in a little joint man. And it just asks questions to answer yes or, it asks patients to answer yes or no to the five questions. So the first question is, have you ever had a swollen joint? Has a doctor ever told you that you have arthritis? Um, do you have fingernails or toenails that have holes or pits? Have you had pain in your heel? And that's getting at the emphasitis piece. Have you had a finger or toe that was completely swollen or painful for no apparent reason? And that's getting a dactylitis. So if you have a score of three, four, or five, the likelihood of that you have psoriatic arthritis is reasonable. So the, um, the sensitivity of these tools are somewhere around 70%. It varies depending on what population was surveyed. Um, however, you know, we think that three or more deserves a rheumatology visit at least. So if you're a dermatologist or a nurse practitioner or PA working in the dermatology clinic, if you give this survey and the patient has three or more points, um, that's the kind of person that we would want to be seeing in rheumatology for evaluation and maybe be monitoring down the road. Now, this also picks up other joint diseases, obviously. So if you have osteoarthritis of a knee and you had swelling, you were told you had arthritis, and you have nail pits, you would still be picked up by this questionnaire as having potential PSA. So it's not a diagnostic tool at all. It's completely just a screening tool to someone that needs to be evaluated. 
So I mentioned osteoarthritis. What are some of the other things that might um, come up in a, a patient who has psori psoriasis and joint, dis uh, joint pain, for example? So osteoarthritis is gonna be the most common with about half of patients who are over the age of 50 having osteoarthritis of the knees, hips, or f hands. Um, this is different than psoriatic arthritis in that in psoriatic arthritis, you tend to have prolonged morning stiffness, particularly when untreated. Um, in osteoarthritis, there tends to be more brief morning stiffness, um, and that's often called gelling. So once they get, it feels like it's hard to move the fingers, but as they get kind of warmed up over the course of a few minutes, or if they run their hands under hot water, they tend to feel much better. Um, another differentiator is that the DIPs and, uh, sorry, easier to see on my PIP, I mean, on my second finger, DIPs and PIPs are the most commonly involved joints in oster hand osteoarthritis as well as the CMC joint, which is down here. Um, and if you feel those in psoriatic arthritis, an active joint should be kind of squishy. So it should feel like there's actually fluid in there. If it's osteoarthritis, you tend to mostly feel bony protuberance. So it's a little, um, that can be, help be a differentiator. And if you have these nice discrete little round nodules on the sides of the DIP or PIP, that would be more consistent with osteoarthritis. Um, osteoarthritis tends to be very slowly progressive. Psoriatic arthritis can be that way too, so it can be different. That doesn't help se separate it out too much. Um, but uh, it is important to kind of think through osteoarthritis versus psoriatic arthritis. Um, we see a lot of misdiagnoses of psoriatic arthritis being just osteoarthritis. And that's not going to get better with our biologic drugs. All right, the next one is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so a lot of times people ask, how do you differentiate psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis in a patient who has a positive rheumatoid factor um, or even a positive CCP? So CCP doesn't necessarily separate all that well. It tends to be much more high titer in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Same with the rheumatoid factor. You can get low titer rheumatoid factor and, and low titer CCP in patients with psoriatic arthritis. The distribution tends to be helpful though. If you have symmetric um, inflammatory arthritis of your MCPs, PIPs, and wrists, for example, that's gonna be much more of a rheumatoid arthritis type pattern. Early in the treatment pathway, this may not make a big difference, but it can help be helpful in distinguishing which treatment you're gonna use down the line. Um, crystal arthropathy is actually quite common in psoriasis, in particular gout. Um, CPPD can also happen. There's a difference in the characteristics of the disorder, particularly early when this starts. Gout tends to have a very acute onset, so the patient wakes up in the middle of the night. They might have uh, tenderness and really distinct allodynia or kind of pain to sight, uh, light touch of their first toe, for example. First toe is the most common joint. It can be the midfoot, ankle, lower extremity joints in general, um, or other joints, but it tends to start lower extremity. Uh, and so the acute onset is really helpful in distinguishing those two and, and the swelling as well. And, and it tends to resolve on its own or with NSAIDs or colchicine, uh, where psoriatic arthritis is less commonly resolves on its own, although it can get pretty um, quickly better on an NSAID, particularly early in the course of the disease. Um, next is fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia and or, and or central sensitization is a pain syndrome that ca causes widespread pain is really difficult to set, sort out from psoriatic arthritis sometimes, particularly um, because they can overlap. So you can have both psoriatic arthritis and fibromyalgia. In fact, around 20% of patients with psoriatic arthritis have both. Um, I separated this out in terms of if you don't have swelling, then it's, uh, but you have tenderness in many different areas, uh, that tends to be more likely fibromyalgia. And having pain in the muscles, for example, that's not gonna be psoriatic arthritis, that's gonna be fibromyalgia more likely. So they have a lot more soft tissue pain and the pain is more widespread. They also tend to have really severe fatigue, um, more on that high end, as well as sleep disturbance. Um, and also they often have that brain fog or kind of trouble thinking. Um, there's an, a really helpful handout from the American College of Rheumatology on their website. If you go to the patient portal or patient website, there's a fibromyalgia ha handout that has the um, widespread pain uh, kind of criteria in there to help just talk through the patient, uh, talk through those criteria with the patient. And often the patient will help, uh, will kind of self-identify with a lot of the factors in fibromyalgia. Um, finally, something for rheumatologists and dermatologists to keep in mind is that sometimes 
uh, dermatomyositis can be psoriasis form, and they can also sometimes have a, an inflammatory arthritis that involves small joints. So just always something to keep in the back of the mind if it's not fitting just right with psoriatic arthritis. All right, so now that we talked to the differential diagnosis, how do we initiate a workup for psoriatic arthritis? Well, the workup is gonna be fairly similar to the workup for psoriasis or workup for other disorders, including rheumatoid arthritis. So probably some of the things you're familiar with. Um, for example, just getting basic labs because it's gonna inform treatment selection, like a CBC, a creatinine and liver function test, so CBC and complete metabolic panel, for example. A C-reactive protein can be helpful. It's only elevated in about 50% of patients, so it's not always, it's not helpful in distinguishing or diagnosis, but if it's elevated, that can help you kind of monitor um, uh, the inflammatory marker as you're starting therapy, for example. Um, tuberculosis screening using quantiferin gold, for example, or PPD if they're not immunosuppressed um, is useful because you're probably gonna start therapy soon. The same with hepatitis B and hepatitis C uh, screening. If you're gonna have them get these tests and come back, it might be helpful to have them get their vaccinations or talk to the primary care doctor about getting their vaccinations. Because once we start an immunosuppressive therapy, it's going to be harder to mount the same um, response to a vaccine. So it's great if we can get those done before they get started on therapy. Um, and this is particularly true for live vaccines. We don't have so many of those anymore now that we have um, a killed uh, zoster vaccine. But if they need to get a, a zoster vaccine, that would be um, good to do that before they got started on their therapy. Um, and then finally, radiographs. So if there's a specific joint that you think um, is involved, you may consider getting baseline hand x-rays, for example, the hands are involved. You may consider getting x-rays of the sacroiliac joints. We're gonna come back to that in one minute. Um, but you don't need to get x-rays for everyone when you do a first workup. Um, most people are gonna have normal x-rays. But if you see some joint abnormalities or joint deformities, that can be helpful. Um, and if, you're, if they do have hand involvement, it's nice to get a baseline or feet involvement. All right, so what are the assessments for axial disease? One of the most common pitfalls that I see in terms of people coming to me for second opinions is that they've um, had an assessment for axial disease by getting a lumbar spine film. So this is incorrect because most of the time axial disease is gonna start in sacroiliac joints. So you wanna get a pelvis films first. So that would be a, set, a dedicated sacroiliac joint films that have the patients opening their hips. You can get a good view of these, those sacroiliac joints. Um, so not lumbar spine films go with the sacroiliac joint films. Additionally, I mentioned that there's the spectrum of axial spinal arthritis. So a lot of patients are being caught before they have x-ray damage. So in that case, you wanna check with an MRI. And then we get, again, an MRI of the pelvis, not of the lumbar spine. So an MRI of the pelvis without contrast, you don't actually need contrast, you want stir images, which is just um, a form of the T1 weighting. So, um, if they are asymptomatic, you, can, you don't necessarily need to assess for that unless you're kind of making treatment decisions that would involve whether or not they're having, they have axial disease. But for asymptomatic patients, I don't necessarily always get radiographs. So if you're a dermatologist, you may not need to do this. If you're a rheumatologist, I would suggest kind of at least assessing for inflammatory back pain or history of inflammatory back pain and then considering pelvic x-rays at, um, at minimum. All right, so in this first module, we reviewed the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis or classification criteria, really the CASPAR criteria. We talked about the heterogeneity of the disease and different ways in which the disease can present, all the different things that kind of come together that we need to know about when we're assessing the disease in order to make a comprehensive treatment plan. And then we've talked about um, assessing for the disease and screening, using screening tools, as well as kind of initiating an initial workup. So with that, we're gonna close uh, section one and move on to section two. So in section two, we're gonna cover treatment and kind of building a comprehensive treatment plan. Um, so we're gonna the objective for this section is to integrate clinical evidence for targeted therapies when individualizing treatment for patients with psoriatic arthritis, including their effects on patient reported outcomes. So I'll summarize that as saying, treating psoriatic arthritis. So when I talk about treating psoriatic arthritis, I often talk about treating the whole patient. So when we think about, as rheumatologists, the patient sitting in front of us, we're often making a plan for their disease. But what I wanna encourage you to do is take the disease out of the center and put it along the ring of things and the patient in the center. 
Um, so the treating the psoriatic arthritis is one part of it, but there's many things that are gonna affect how the patient is doing and how the patient's gonna respond. So in, in my little diagram here, you'll see musculoskeletal disease and skin disease are kind of part of this. So when we create a treatment plan, we wanna consider both the joint and emphysis dactylitis axial disease components or the MSK components, as well as skin and nail disease. And some, in doing that, um, we may involve our dermatology colleagues, and this is where our dermatology colleagues can play a big role as well. Um, so I just kind of mentioned here, we'll talk more a little bit about, uh, about derm room connections, but one way to collaborate is through what we kind of call virtual clinics or even in-person combined clinics. So in-person combined clinics see and, uh, have a dermatologist and a rheumatologist seeing the patient together at the same time. Um, in a virtual clinic, you're seeing them separately, but then connecting together uh, the rheumatologist and dermatologist to talk about the treatment plan. Um, this is particularly helpful in patients who have both severe psoriasis and moderate severe psoriatic arthritis, for example. And especially as you get along down the road in terms of treatment options, you wanna be selecting the best treatments that are gonna cover all the patient's disease features. And we'll come back to that treatment selection piece in a, bit, in a minute. Um, next is treatment burden. So in thinking about selecting a therapy, we're gonna think about what the patient really wants and what their needs are. Um, so for example, if they're traveling frequently, it may not be a great idea to have a weekly injection. Um, and if they uh, can't tolerate, they have GI issues when they can't tolerate swallowing pills, that might be another option. So treatment burden comes in all different flavors, but to kind of consider with the patient, the modalities, and what's most important to them in selecting a therapy. Um, specialty pharmacies are particularly helpful for this. So for example, if we do prescribe a therapy and the patient's having difficulty with it, the patient can check in with a pharmacist. In addition, we need to consider all the patient's concomitant conditions. So we've already reviewed the comorbidities, um, but it's really important to consider these comorbidities when selecting therapies because certain therapies will um, worsen uh, different targets. For example, we don't wanna give certain therapies to patients with inflammatory bowel disease. On the other hand, there are certain therapies that treat inflammatory bowel disease. So we want to know all their comorbidities so that we can then go forward and select the best therapy. Next, we want to consider how the patient is functioning in their world in order to help think about other things that may support the patient. For example, if the patient is at a desk job, desk jobs tend to be very difficult for patients with inflammatory arthritis because if they're not moving, they get really stiff. And so we want them to kind of stay in a movement position or at least get up and move frequently. So sometimes having a standing desk is helpful. Um, there are occupational therapists, and specifically within large companies, there, there are ergonomic evaluations that can happen. So helping patients recognize that is really helpful. Um, family and friends. So it can be really difficult to be the sick person in the family. Um, so sometimes people need help thinking about how they're gonna work within their family and when their friends, particularly when they first diagnose, are diagnosed with this disorder. So um, having a therapist to help walk through that is really helpful. So I recommend talk therapy for many of my patients. And this is also true for um, managing the depression and anxiety that I already mentioned, just coping. Um, so not only is therapy helpful there, but introducing mindfulness can be really helpful, as well as um, psychiatry for, and having primary care, vis uh, primary care physicians help with prescribing medicines for depression and anxiety. Next, sleep and fatigue are both multifactorial symptoms. So not all fatigue is related to the psoriatic disease itself, but some can be. Um, and if obviously you have disturbed sleep, you're gonna be fatigued. So uh, sometimes getting to the sleep is the root of the problem. Additionally, I think the less sleep people have, the more likely they are to have flare or symptoms of central sensitization. So sleep can be really key for patients and improving quality of life. So uh, you may consider referring for sleep evaluations for with the sleep physician. Additionally, we have a pen of sleep psychologist who's been instrumental in helping a lot of our patients with sleep. Sometimes our patients just don't have good sleep hygiene and that's hard to recognize and hard to work through. And it's a behavior change and any kind of behavior change is difficult by definition. So um, sleep psychologists can help work on cognitive behavioral therapy to help improve sleep. And then finally, we have lifestyle. Lifestyle is really important uh, when considering how to, to make a treatment plan for the patient. So for example, if you're a smoker, you're much more likely to have um, poor disease activity and to not respond well to therapy. So smoking cessation, addressing that is important. 
Additionally, regular exercise is really important for all aspects of inflammatory arthritis, but especially for people who have concomitant fibromyalgia. If you have, if you have fibromyalgia, you need to do regular extra, aerobic exercise. And I think that's generally true for all of our patients with inflammatory arthritis. Helping patients figure out what that balance is in terms of not causing more pain, but improving fitness is really important. And physical therapy can be critical, critically helpful for that. Finally, while we don't have good evidence about diet, clearly a lot of patients know that diet does have an impact on their disease. And each patient seems to have something different. So it might be alcohol worsens their disease symptoms, for example, or it might be that some patients feel better on a gluten-free diet or an autoimmune diet or just a Mediterranean diet, healthy diet in general. Getting rid of sugar sometimes helps patients. Um, what I tell patients in general is that you need to keep your diet for about eight weeks in order to really know if it works. So it's not like it's going to help today. And often you don't necessarily know that it works until you go back to your regular diet. So the indiscretions often tell you when it's not working. Um, so working with nutritionists to help figure that out can be helpful. I know in large health systems, it's hard to find nutritionists. There's a lot of nutrition services online now, um, so patients can look for that as well. All right, so we reviewed kind of all the things that are important to consider. Now, I know this is a lot of things to consider as you're building a treatment plan. You don't have to do it all at one time. It's good to get a lot of this stuff in the history in the very beginning. You might not tackle every piece. In fact, it's probably not effective to tackle every piece in one single visit because you completely overwhelm the patient. But um, tackling different pieces at different times is important to keep your eye on the comprehensive treatment plan. All right, so now let's talk about the different available therapies. So I've mentioned some of the non-pharmacologic therapies already, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, smoking cessation, um, weight loss, I'll come back to shortly. That's one of our most effective non-pharmacologic therapies. Massage therapy, it feels good. It's not going to last long, it, but it can help with just kind of stress reduction in the moment or help with pain in the moment. And exercise I've already touched on is really important, I think. Not listed there is acupuncture, which can be helpful for patients to feel better, um, especially for managing pain. Um, there's just not great evidence specifically in psoriatic arthritis, so it hasn't made this list. All right. What are some other options? So symptomatic therapies. NSAIDs are one of the common symptomatic therapies. Uh, there's, these are commonly used across treatment, so from the very first treatment to concomitant use with all of our other therapies as well. Um, we know that there's an increased risk with NSAIDs and cardiovascular disease. It's not clear how much over um, the baseline cardiovascular risk there is, but certainly you want to evaluate their cardiovascular risk in terms of prescribing. You wouldn't necessarily prescribe NSAIDs to a high cardiovascular risk. It's also important to note that you don't have to try NSAIDs to, to go on to a next therapy. I think that's kind of a mis, um, uh, misnomer in that you have to try an NSAID first before you go on to the next therapy. That's not the case. Local glucocorticoid injections are also really helpful um, just for symptomatic relief as well and commonly used in, in rheumatology clinical practice. Um, systemic glucocorticoids can be used as well these are generally should be used in the shortest course, or at the, uh, for the shortest course at the smallest dose possible. Um, one additional consideration, a couple additional considerations in psoriatic disease are that as you wean corticosteroids, you can spark a flare of psoriasis, and this flare can happen up to four weeks after you stop with this, the corticosteroids. So we discourage the use of um, steroids as much as possible, but sometimes you do need it. Um, additionally, because of that increased risk for diabetes that I mentioned, this is particularly important in our patients when we're thinking about glucocorticoids. Again, if you start glucocorticoids, watch that sugar um, on the labs and talk with patients about that risk as well. All right, so now let's move on to the other cl classes of therapies. So we have um, a series of biologic therapies, but first we have the oral small molecules. This is a renaming from the American College of Rheumatology and National Psoriasis Foundation guidelines from 2018. Um, they used to be called CSDMARDs, and you'll often see that, conventional synthetic DMARDs. This is a term borrowed from rheumatoid arthritis, but to date, none of these drugs in this category have evidence of, pro of prohibiting radiographic progression. Um, and that's partly just that they don't have evidence. A lot of these drugs just don't have studies that have evaluated x-ray endpoints. 
Um, but it's important to consider that they don't have that evidence. Uh, so methotrexate, sulfasalazine, cyclosporine, the flanamide, and a premolast are the drugs in this group. Cyclosporine is not commonly used. That's a difficult to monitor drug. Um, it can help bring down psoriasis really quickly, so sometimes dermatologists use it. Um, methotrexate, rheumatologists know well, as well as do dermatologists. Um, in this disease, in this population, we do want to consider obesity and diabetes because these are risk factors for liver function abnormalities with methotrexate. So just something to keep in mind. Um, Sulfasalazine does not treat the psoriasis. So if you have a patient with moderate severe psoriasis, don't, don't use the sulfasalazine. Uh, Luflonamide, similar to methotrexate, they both have my, mild psoriasis benefit. Probably methotrexate has better psoriasis benefit than luflonamide. And a premlast um, is newer to the market and from 2014. Um, this one has some GI side effects and um, uh, for up to 20% of people and has a warning for depression, but otherwise it's a really, it's a fairly well tolerated drug. Um, it's gonna work for mild psoriasis and mild psoriatic arthritis, um, particularly oligoarticular disease, for example. All right, so now let's move on to the biologics. Um, next to the biologics, you see that there's two boxes that say AXPA. That's because those are the only drugs that are currently um, approved for use in ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and a couple of those drugs, specifically sirolizumab, um, is approved for non-radiographic axial spa, although I think we'll see several of those drugs getting that label very soon. Uh, Etanercept, infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, and sirtilizumab are all TNF inhibitors. They work very similarly for the inflammatory arthritis. They all work for axial disease. They do have differences, though. Tanercept doesn't work well for inflammatory bowel disease or for uveitis. So if you have those as concomitant conditions, I wouldn't use those. Um, the, strong, the best drugs for the skin in this category are the adalimumab, infliximab, and sertiluzumab. Um, if the patient has inflammatory bowel disease, um, adalimumab and infliximab work for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Sertiluzumab is used for Crohn's and glumab is used for ulcerative colitis. So this is where knowing what the patient has really helps dictate which therapy you're going to choose. Ustekinumab is an interleukin-12-23 inhibitor, so it's the P40 subunit of both of those two molecules. Um, it's dosed at four, 0, 4, and every 12 weeks, so people really like that dosing scheme sometimes. This is going to be better for skin disease and better for mild psoriatic arthritis, so it's not as strong for the psoriatic arthritis in general. It takes a little longer to work for some of the patients with psoriatic arthritis too. So if you do try this, you might want them to hang in there for about six months, up to six months. Um, next to the IL-17 inhibitors, there's secukinumab and ixekizumab. They're both IL-17A inhibitors. Um, these work nearly identically for the most part. The difference is really in the dosing scheme. Um, there's two doses for each of them, the psoriasis dose and the psoriatic arthritis dose. Uh, the psoriatic arthritis dose, um, I tend to use the psoriasis dose for most of these, which is an increased dose from the, from the uh, psoriatic arthritis dose, and then I go down. That's just my personal preference, um, but you can use either dosing scheme. Um, Abitacet is a CTLA-4-IG. This basically doesn't work for skin disease. Um, it has very minimal efficacy for the psoriasis, and it works for psoriatic arthritis, and similar to a primalacinutikinumab. Tofacitinib is the only currently approved JAK inhibitor for psoriatic arthritis, likely two more to join this soon. Um, so uh, tofacitinib is not approved for psoriasis, it's only approved for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, there have been some new warnings for tofacitinib, so that's also keep, keep in mind the venous thromboembolism and cardiovascular risk there. That's a label across the category. Uh, and then finally, there's the interleukin-23 inhibitors, guselkimab, rizinkizumab, and tildrakizumab. Guselkimab and rizinkizumab are being commonly used in psoriasis now, so you may see this quite frequently. Both, all three of these drugs are being tested in psoriatic arthritis. The guselkimab phase three studies have now been published, and this has already been submitted to the FDA. So this will probably be the first one to be approved for psoriatic arthritis in the near future. Um, the dosing, we'll wait to see. It may be similar to, psori to psoriasis, but it actually may be a higher dose for psoriatic arthritis or more frequent dosing, and, or at least they, there may be that option. So something to consider and look for when that finally is available. All right, so how do we consider, now that we have all those drugs, what to start first? So I'm gonna present data from the 2018 
ACR and PF guidelines. Um, we actually already have new therapies from the time this guideline was published in early 2019. So some things to consider here that not all the therapies, including the IL-23 inhibitors, are not in here. Um, and there was only early data from some of these drugs. So there's been a lot more data that's come out in the past year, including head-to-head -head trials that weren't available at the time of these guidelines. Uh, first of all, there are no pathways in the ACR guidelines. They're literally a pairwise comparison between all the available therapy classes at the time. Almost everything in these guidelines is conditional, meaning it's really up to the patient and the clinician. This is just a general recommendation based on the current data available. So always discuss the risks and benefits. One of the most useful pieces of the ACR NPF recommendations that I think are the def definitions of severe PSA and severe psoriasis. So these can be used to send to insurers to help show the need for these particular therapies, for example. Um, so severe PSA may involve function limiting disease, even if it's at a couple of joints, for example. For example, the violinist or the pianist that has one or two fingers that are involved, um, they need those fingers, they're critical to their job. And so that would be kind of this function limiting PSA and thus be severe PSA requiring a biologic, for example. Um, in severe psoriasis could be having um, places like your face involved, for example, that might you know, be very emotionally impactful um, or physically impactful, for example, genital psoriasis. So if you have emotion, uh, mental or physical functioning impairment from psoriasis, that counts as severe psoriasis. All right, so let's pause here and do another audience response question. All right, so these are complex statements because they involve multiple pieces. Um, so A, would have been true if we remove serious infections. C um, would have not been true anyway because you don't use IL-17 inhibitors in inflammatory bowel disease. Thus, B is true. So you would not preferentially give an IL-17 inhibitors to patients who have inflammatory bowel disease because it can exacerbate inflammatory bowel disease. So an IL-23 inhibitor, 12 23 inhibitor, which is approved for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, it would be preferred instead. All right, so within the ACR uh, guidelines, I'm gonna walk through a couple of these, um, just some of the high points at least, because it's a very long document. Um, but when you look through these, you'll see that there's only five uh, recommendations that are strong recommendations, meaning there's actually really good data. So the first one is that, in the first three actually, are basically that in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, don't treat IBD with drugs that don't work in IBD. So for example, don't use Tanercept and don't use um, Ixacizumab or Secukinumab, the IL-17 inhibitors. So those have become strong recommendations because you should use drugs that work in IVD in IVD. Next, um, in patients who have serious infections, you would, you would start with an oral small molecule over a TNF inhibitor. And this is because there's a black box warning for uh, serious infections in, patients, uh, for, in the TNF inhibitors as a class. Finally, in adult patients who smoke, you should tell them not to smoke because smoking is bad for everybody. Um, and it's still bad for everybody, especially patients with psoriatic arthritis, because first of all, they have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, but also smoking can worsen their disease activity. It is associated with more aggressive um, disease activity and, and decreased response to therapy. All right, so one of the critical changes in the ACR and PF treatment guidelines that is not in other guidelines is to use a TNF inhibitor first um, over oral small molecules such as methotrexate in patients who are treatment naive with psoriatic arthritis. So this is a big difference from previous recommendations. This recommendation was based on available data which showed that TNF inhibitors resulted in radiographic damage uh, inhibition, um, but also that people had better responses in general in the trials. And again, this is partly a data gap because we didn't have a lot of, of data in the oral small molecule realm. And that, that we had showed rel smaller responses overall than the TNF inhibitors as a class. Um, now, this is a conditional recommendation and within each of these different recommendations, there's a series of different things that you can read within the tables that say, when would that recommendation not be true? So for example, if a patient has really mild disease, you're probably not gonna start with a biologic. You probably start with an oral small molecule, such as methotrexate or premolas, for example. Um, so those conditions are actually quite important. So it's not that we should start with a TNF inhibitor in everyone, it's that in patients with moderate to severe psoriatic arthritis, 
you would start with the TNF inhibitor first. In addition, um, TNF inhibitors were selected first over other biologics because um, of the greater amount of data available for TNF inhibitors. So we have 20 plus years with TNF inhibitors and less data with the other ones. This may change as more data is available and more head-to-head -head data in particular is available. All right, speaking of head-to-head -head data and more data being available, since these recommendations, there was a head-to-head -head trial comparing a Tanercept, a TNF inhibitor, versus methotrexate, versus combination therapy. So combination therapy is something we do a lot in rheumatology because we've learned this from uh, rheumatoid arthritis. The patients generally have done better in patient, in, um, when they're on combination therapy, methotrexate, plus a biologic therapy. So this is the first study to really test that question in psoriatic arthritis. Um, so they, they took treatment-naive patients, they randomized them to one of these three groups, and then they looked at 24 weeks and 48 weeks at the responses. And what they really saw is that at 24 weeks, there's not much of a difference in the combination therapy versus a tanercept alone. So methotrexate didn't provide an additional benefit if you were starting a tanercept. Um, additionally, being on either a tanercept plus methotrexate or a tanercept alone was significantly better than methotrexate. The ACR response rates, or ACR20 response rates, versus a 20% improvement in joint manifestations um, and five separate criteria. Uh, if you had a 20% improvement, um, that happened in about 50% of patients on methotrexate and about 60% of patients receiving a Tanercept alone. So there was a difference, and it was statistically significant. Not a large difference, though. Not as large as we might have thought based on the other available data. So this has a couple things. One is you may not need to start combination therapy. However, I want to caution you in the interpretation of this data that it's not like we followed these patients for a long time to discontinuation of the drug. We only have data through 48 weeks. In psoriatic arthritis, in, in rheumatoid arthritis, it's thought that methotrexate prolongs the life of the drug. We have also seen this to be true with infliximab and adalimumab in psoriatic arthritis. So this drug, we, we may not be seeing that here because it's a tanercept or we may not be seeing that here because we don't have long enough follow-up to know how many people um, adding methotrexate may have benefited. So there's a caveat with um, interpretation of that data. Um, finally, the most important data I think that comes from this is the radiographic progression data. There was statistically less progression in the patients who were treated with the Tanercept compared to those who were treated with methotrexate alone. So we think that may show superiority in terms of, um, it, it does show superiority in terms of radiographic progression. That being said, the amount of progression is tiny because the, it's a really hard outcome measure in these studies of treatment naive psoriatic arthritis. So again, caution interpreting that, but again, doesn't support that methotrexate has any radiographic benefit. All right, now that we've talked through a few of the therapies, some of the different considerations in selecting therapies, in particular about combination therapy. Let's talk about weight loss. This is one of my favorite topics. When we talk about ACR20 responses or 20% improvement in 50% of patients, that means we have a long way to go. And so therapy alone may not do it for our patients. So that's why we need to think about some of these other things and weight loss is one of those. Um, so this was a study out of Italy in which they took patients who were initiating a TNF inhibitor and then they randomized them to one of two diets. One was a freely managed diet, and the other one was a, a low-calorie low diet aiming for weight loss. Um, so then they monitored people over the course of six months, or actually 12 months, but at six months, they looked to see whether or not there was a difference. And so there was significant benefit in the people on the um, uh, intervention diet compared to the freely managed diet. Um, but the one of the more striking findings was that, was that in either diet, if you lost weight, you had a significant, um, you were significantly more likely to achieve minimal disease activity. So what that means is that if you lost five to 10% of your body weight compared to someone who lost less than 5% of their body weight, you were 3.7 times more likely to achieve minimal disease activity. That's more substantial than any of our other drugs. And then if you lost greater than 10% of your body weight, you were 6.67 times more likely to achieve minimal disease activity. So among obese patients, weight loss can have a tremendous effect. We don't know if this is just volume of distribution. We think that it's more than that. It's probably more about functional ability and that these patients probably get moving a little bit more. 
but there's been a number of studies that have demonstrated that weight loss has significant benefits in terms of patient reported outcomes, um, but also physician assessed outcomes as well. So I mentioned minimal disease, disease activity. So when we're considering treat to target, we want minimal disease activity is, our, is one of our targets. There are two different targets you can use. You can use a C-DAPSA or a DAPSA disease activity and psoriatic arthritis index, which I'll come back to, or the minimal disease activity. Minimal disease activity means that you have to assess seven different criteria and that the patient meets the criteria if they have five of seven of those in that target range. So the things you need to assess are tender and swollen joint count, an enthesitis index, um, psoriasis area, so that could be a, by a body surface area or number of palms of psoriasis in the patient's body, uh, patient pain, patient global assessment, and then the health assessment questionnaire. So for those of you in the United States, we often do a rapid three that includes all three of those components, which is really helpful. Um, so the scales for these are the kind of cutoffs are that you want a tender joint kind of one or less, a swollen joint kind of one or less, a body surface area of less than or equal to three, actually three palms of psoriasis in the body is still quite a bit. So um, some people suggest that it should be less than one, but the official criteria currently say three. Um, a tender and thesis of one or less, and then the patient criteria, a pain score of 1.5 on a scale of zero to 10 or 15 on a scale of zero to 100 uh, or less, um, a physician, a patient global assessment of less than 20 on a scale of zero to 10, sorry, zero to 100 or two or less on a scale of zero to 10. And for the health assessment questionnaire, it's a, a score of 0 0.5 um, or less on a scale of zero to three. Obviously, that needs to be transformed for the rapid three. If you're using the ND hack, that scales zero to 10. All right, so let's talk a little bit about drugs and development before we finish this section. So there's a number of different drugs and development. Some are getting quite close to um, being available. So first, Kuselkimab, Tildekizumab, Rizikizumab, I mentioned already, the P19 subunit inhibitors um, of IL-23, so the IL-23 inhibitors. They work in very similar ways, but they're each a little bit, uh, Tildekizumab is a little different than the other two. Um, the gosalkimab and rizikizumab are quite similar overall. Dosing intervals might be a little bit different. Gosalkimab is the closest to approval for psoriatic arthritis. The other two are in progress as well, with phase two already complete and in the phase two, phase three phase. Um, bradalumab is an IL-17 receptor blocker that is approved for psoriasis. Currently, dermatologists know this well, this is a drug that has to be prescribed by someone licensed to prescribe the drug. So you have to have been part of the REMS program, which is the risk mitigation program. Um, one of the issues in the Bradalumab trials was that they had a higher rate of suicide in the treatment arm and suicide ideation. So uh, I'm not sure if that's related to the drug or related to the, just the numbers. It was a relatively small number of people, but in any case, it's prescribed only by people who are licensed to prescribe it. I'm not sure if this is moving forward for psoriatic arthritis. There are some um, trials, including a phase two trial that was published in the New England Journal. Um, bimikizumab is an IL-17A and F um, inhibitor. So this is different than secukizumab and ixikizumab in that they're IL-17A inhibitors only. This is A and F. So we're not exactly sure what that difference means, but um, it, in the phase two studies that looked really good for psoriatic arthritis, um, and the phase three studies are ongoing. Phase, it's nearing completion or submission for psoriasis if it's not already submitted, so I think this will be probably available for psoriasis relatively soon. Um, Filgotinib and upadacitinib are both JAK inhibitors, so upadacitinib is approved for rheumatoid arthritis already, and the phase two, three for psoriatic arthritis looks actually quite good. They've um, already put out a press release on the results, and the results will be um, probably presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting or, or, or ULAR meeting if that happens um, in 2020. So that should be available soon. Filgotinib um, is nearing approval, I believe, or um, close to approval for rheumatoid arthritis and has been studied in ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis and is in phase three studies for those diseases as well. And again, also looks quite good in both diseases. We have discussed a wide range of thought about treatment. So we talked about all the different areas to consider. And then we've drilled down into therapies specifically for psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis.
We've talked through combination therapy. We talked the, about the importance of combining additional therapies with your prescribed therapies, such as non-pharmacologic therapies or other approaches, such as um, talk therapy, and also getting primary care invo uh, providers involved, or at least assessing for those other situations. Um, finally, we've talked about drugs and development, and that this area is constantly developing. So um, we look forward to kind of seeing some of this new data and thinking about how we're gonna integrate all these different drugs into treatment algorithms. Um, with that, we'll conclude section two and uh, move on to section three. Welcome back to our um, third and final section of this um, uh, program. So the objective of this last section is to kind of think about how we can implement this in, within uh, each of our individual practices. So I've talked a lot about in the previous couple sections about how to assess the disease, how to screen for the disease, and how to think about building a treatment plan. How do you actually put that into action? Um, so the objective for this uh, third section is to implement comprehensive, multidisciplinary patient-centered approaches to treating PSA, taking into account patient preference and presence of comorbidities. So let's start with the audio response question here. All right, so obviously, ideally, we ask people 100% of the time at each visit um, of what's bothering them the most. Um, we've done this within our clinic just to kind of get a sense of what people say. Um, and as you might expect that skin might be bothersome sometimes, the joint might be bothersome, the most bothersome sometimes. Those two things are informative in and of themselves. But then sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's the sleep, sometimes it's the family issues, um, sometimes it's the other things. So, that really helps us think about how to build the right kind of treatment plan. Um, we asked patients about how often that they were asked this by their provider um, in a national survey and found that only about 30% of people were asked about things other than their joints and their skin. So um, it's important to ask patients this and kind of provide some context. It's also important to ask patients about what's bothering them and what's most important to them because often we have a disconnect with patients about what's most important. When I'm looking at the patient, I'm focused on their joints because I'm the rheumatologist and this is what I do day in, day out. And so if I don't think to ask about their fatigue or their sleep or their pain, um, I might miss something and then the patient's not gonna have an optimal outcome because we're not addressing what's most important to them. Uh, so in this particular study, they asked patients, rheumatologists and dermatologists their perceptions of, of psoriatic symptoms. They called it the disconnect study. And what they found is there really is a disconnect. So patients found certain things much more important than, than the physicians. You know, fatigue is one of those. Emotional well-being is another one. There have been several studies like this that have demonstrated this disconnect. So it's important to ask. All right, so how do we consider building a team to help treat the patient with psoriatic arthritis? Well, in today's world, it can be very complex to build a team. So there's so many different providers that were um, seeing patients that a patient may have multiple different providers in different locations. And obviously it's easiest if it's all within one institution, then we share messages back and forth. But messages back and forth isn't always the optimal way to practice. Um, and those messages can get lost or people get busy and we all get so many messages. So one of the ways that we would suggest doing this is to have build your own team. So you might have a rheumatologist and dermatologist that you work with frequently. We send each other patients back and forth. And then we might have the cardiologist as a part of our team and psychiatrist as a part of our team and so on. And that can be a virtual team and that you're referring back and forth. Um, it, even the, having a set of gastroenterologists, someone that you can pick up the phone, you know their uh, phone numbers, so you can even text them while you're in the room, just to be able to get a sense of what they think about the treatment plan. This is really the best way to deliver patient care. It's hard to do, but if you have your team in place and you start to work with your team and you like your team, and it's actually, actually a lot of fun because you can learn a lot from your teammates. Um, so what, what are some of the different things that you might think about in a holistic team management? Um, this would be all the things that we had in that previous slide, which are someone who's going to help with the joints. That might be the rheumatologist, so it's me in this particular circumstance. The skin, that might be you, the dermatologist, or someone else, or primary care physician. Um, and obviously there's lots of primary care physicians, but uh, it's nice to have a few that you know well that you can refer patients to that need primary care physicians. Uh, a nutritionist, if you even have a nutrition service that you're aware of or somewhere to refer the patient. Physical therapy, so we have physical therapy within our, depart our, our um, health system, 
but it's nice to know a few that you can refer to that they know kind of uh, your diseases. So psoriatic arthritis or axial disease in particular, um, it's nice to know that patients, these physical, physical therapists have a knowledge of inflammatory arthritis and what that means for patients. Um, you may have uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist, or at least a, a referral service that you can send the patient to. Um, there's also a lot of virtual therapy groups now that might that can provide services. So it's good to build your team and think about all those components that were around the circle from that previous slide that I showed in section two. So in general, we feel that having a multidisciplinary program in which you have a dermatologist and, working, and rheumatologist working together results in much better outcomes. Not only does it result in better treatment outcomes, but it also results in better diagnostic outcomes. If you're a dermatologist working with a rheumatologist frequently, you start to understand what we're looking for and how we assess the disease. And vice versa is also true. So as a rheumatologist working with dermatologists frequently, I know a lot about treating the skin that I wouldn't have learned if I wouldn't have been working with them. So it's just like when you're in tra training, you're still in training in terms of your uh, team members' discipline. It's really a lot of fun that way, and I think truly the best patient outcomes come from that kind of collaboration. Uh, so we've developed a network across the United States called the Pac-Man Network. So it's a psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis clinics multi-center network, a multi-center advancement network. It's always a mouthful. That's why we call it Pac-Man. Um, so this is a group of uh, centers that have a combined rheumatologist and dermatologist. And on our website, we have a variety of different resources. So we have a, an epic template note for the rheumatologist assessing psoriatic arthritis. We have an epic template note for the dermatologist assessing psoriatic arthritis. Um, we also have a, a toolkit for how to build a combined clinic, and it kind of tells you about some of the things that your administrative uh, team might want to know about when you're building a clinic, well, how you're going to make revenue, how you're going to get the revenue in, um, what, is, what is the operation going to look like, what kinds of staff do you need. So those are some things that we've put into the, that little, that resource. You can find that at pacman, P-P-A-C-M-A-N.org. We also are kind of conducting a variety of different studies. So if you're interested in being a part of that network, let us know. With that discussion, let's wrap up um, some of the things that we talked about from sections one, two, and three of this, uh, of this course. Um, so one of the things that we want you to walk away with, with is some specific knowledge about how to accurately diagnose psoriatic arthritis. So we talked in section one about the initial workup. We talked about classification criteria, the CASPER criteria. We talked about the range of different features of the disease. So hopefully that makes, helps you to make an accurate diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis. Um, we also hope that just talking through the different symptoms will help reduce the delay in patients coming from dermatology or primary care into rheumatology. Um, we, we have talked through a variety of different treatment targets and kind of some of the considerations in using those treatment targets. Uh, so we hope that using that knowledge, you can apply um, these treatments to patients with psoriatic arthritis and selecting the best therapy. What I haven't mentioned is um, we have a, we just built a new decision aid that will be available to everyone. It is already available in a, in a uh, early form, but a, a more advanced form will be available soon. Um, it's called psoriasisdecisionaid.com. Um, and if you go to that website, it helps, it takes you through the comorbidities and will help give you a treatment grid at the end of things that you would want to avoid for a patient with specific comorbidities, for example. So it creates a little algorithm for you. Um, finally, in this course, we hope that you'll understand the value of collaborating not only with other healthcare providers, but also with patients and making them an integral part of the treatment decisions through asking um, what's bothering them most and what, what they need in order to be successful in their life living with these disorders. All right, well, in conclusion, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for your attention and, um, and all the learning that I hope you've done today. Uh, please visit the PSA Digital Hub at the web address listed here. Um, there's additional educational activities, resources, and tools to improve the care of patients with psoriatic arthritis. Thanks so much for having me today.